Hotel is a place for people people that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. Godtel is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. Godtel is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. Godtel is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on at God Tell. Isn't that a little close to my face, Josh? <laughs> well, I see some of you know how to smile. Some of you don't know it's a choice. Some do. That's okay. We are in James 1.13. <clears throat> the title is the same as last week. We're still working on that issue. Trials and temptations. Some of you weren't here last week, so you don't know yet that trials and temptations and problems are good for you. You think they're bad, but they're not. What's really bad for you is when you have too much and things are going too well. Because you won't seek God when things are going well. But you will if you're in a foxhole and the bullets are flying over your head. That's when you'll seek God. Starting in verse 13, James chapter 1. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning." Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself, and goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue, he's a deceiver of his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Well, let's go back to verse 13. See if we can find out what he's saying to us. Now, this verse, if you're not careful, you'll think it contradicts the first part of the chapter. Because in the first part of the chapter, it says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. But let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. Now, what he's talking about here is tempted to sin. You cannot tempt God to sin. He is not going to sin. And God does not tempt man with evil in order to make him sin. What God does is he puts temptation in your way so that you can have an opportunity to pass a test. And that's where the problem is. Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There is no temptation which overtakes you except that which is common to all men. And God makes a way of escape. He's faithful. The problem is when you don't choose the way of escape. And that's where people get into trouble. I've been dealing with some people at the Livingston Mission that have 
I used to say they have a drinking problem, but they really don't have a problem drinking. <laughs> they have a problem not drinking, that's the problem. And um, one of them was kind of refreshing because he looked me in the face and said, I'm a drunk. Most people won't admit that. And that's a good start. Of course, now he's, he was going through DTs. We're trying to get him straightened out. We took his car keys away from him and told him he couldn't leave the property. You know, if you really want to be pleasing to God, when he sends the trials and the tests, call it a temptation if you want to into your life, you want to pass the test, then you must take the way of escape that God provides. I had to tell this guy, he won't talk to anybody. I said, when you feel the urge to drink, you need to talk to the other guys that have been through this already. Well, he doesn't like to talk to people. He likes to be a loner. And that's one reason why he's a drunk. I had a man come to me one time and said, Brother Gino, I, I'll do anything to quit drinking. Every time I get around my friends, you know, we start drinking, I'll do anything to stop drinking. I said, well, then do this. Have your friends take you out to the woods and tie you to a tree. He said, well, then what do I do? Then tell your friends to leave you there. <laughs> he said, well, I might die. I said, so what? You don't have a life anyway. What difference does it make? I said the same thing to a guy one time. He says, Brother Gene, I'll do anything to get off a crack. I just got to get off this crack. He said, I'll do anything. I said, no, you won't. He said, yes, I will. I said, no, you won't. He said, yes, I will. I said, no, you won't. He said, just tell me. I said, okay, I'll tell you how to get off a crack. It's really easy. Go down to the police station and turn in every drug dealer you know. He says, well, how's that going to stop me? I said, well, they ain't going to sell you no more. That's for sure. <laughs> and then he says to me, well, they might kill me. And I told him the same thing. I said, well, you ain't got a life. What difference does it make? I mean, here you are whining, wanting to get off drugs. You don't have a life. And if you're not willing to do everything or anything to get off those drugs when you want to, then you're just not going to have a life. So what difference does it make if you live or die? Have you ever thought about that? Which is better, to be dead or strung out all the time? That's just a living <laughs> death anyway. But see, people say they want to do anything, but they really don't. Otherwise, they'd go tie themselves to a tree or whatever it takes. That's an, that's an illustration doesn't have to be a literal tree. But what does it take or what is it going to take in your life to get your life straightened out? Number one, of course, commitment to Christ. Jesus can change your life. But most people don't want Jesus to change their life, so they just play at it. Because they want, they're too happy doing their thing. And if they really, really let Jesus have control of their life, then Jesus is going to change their life. Do you think he's going to leave you like you are? What would be the point of that? And I've had people say, well, I don't want Jesus to change me. I said, then you don't want your life straightened out. When I got saved in 1971, Jesus changed my life. And boy, he didn't give me any slack. He just kept backing me in the corners, telling me I can rebel or I can obey. Yeah, that's the only choices he gives you. You one or the other. Make a choice. Get off the fence. There's no fence, but get off it anyway. Get over here and do what you're supposed to do. Folks, it's all about choices. But when you let Jesus come into your heart, then you have someone there who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he will empower you that when you make the right choice to fulfill the right choice. You have to make the choice. He doesn't choose for you. But you see, most people, they won't make a choice. I've had so many people tell me, I don't, want to drink, I don't want to drink anymore. And 15 minutes later, they're at the beer store. Of course, I know none of you ever did any of that. It's those other people that were here last week. They had a real problem. <clears throat> so God doesn't tempt us to sin. God tempts us to test us. And if you don't like the word tempt, just use the word test. It means the same thing. He puts something in your way that you're going to need victory over in order for your life to progress to the next step. And God's real good about putting stuff in your way. That's why you should always be very careful what you say. I will never drink again. First thing you know, God will send somebody to offer you a beer. Sure. 
I remember the day I quit smoking 44 years ago. I went to work on Monday. I quit smoking on Sunday. It was Easter Sunday. I quit smoking, and boy, that was hard for me. I, I enjoyed smoking, especially my cigars. Wolf Brother Rum Soaked Crooks. I can still smell them. <sighs> my wife hated them. She told me she was kissing an ashtray every time she kissed me. Kissed me. <laughs> and I quit smoking, and I went to work Monday. Nobody, the whole time I'd been working there, nobody ever offered me a cigarette until that day. And I walked in. The guy walks up to me and says, here, you want to smoke? I looked at him, and I said, he thought I was crazy. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> He didn't offer me any more cigarettes, that's for sure. He was mad at me. Do whatever it takes. If it means losing a job. I've lost jobs over my convictions about God's word. They wanted me to do stuff that wasn't right. And I've, some of them I quit, some of them I got fired because I wasn't going to do what they said. I am not going to violate God's word for anybody or anything. I told the guys, I've got two guys that I'm trying to help that have this severe drinking appendage, I guess you'd call it. And uh, I told them, I said, you know, guys, I, I, I want to help you, but I'm not going to give up my trust and belief in God's word for your friendship. Drunkards do not go to heaven. Now, it's not what you used to be. It's what you are and what you will be when you die. A lot of people are going to go into heaven and look at, well, come up to the judgment seat of God, and God's going to back up and say, ooh, you stink. You smell like you've been drinking beer. Cerveza. Why, why do they call it Budweiser? I've never known it to make anybody wiser. I've known it to make a lot of people stupid. I've never, I've never seen anybody get smarter by drinking. Have you? No, they get dumb. They do weird things. They say stuff they shouldn't say. You know? They say, I can drive. What's, what's that red light? <laughs> I've never seen anybody that does drugs that gets smarter. You know? Timothy Leary used to say in the 60s, because I'm from that era, L.S. Lee will in, uh, <laughs> enlarge your, expand your mind. That was what he used to say. Yeah, expand your, it doesn't expand your mind. It kills your brain cells. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. I don't mean to be rude, but you all shouldn't drink because you don't have enough brain cells to spare. <laughs> I don't either. I don't know how many I've killed. If I hadn't killed so many brain cells, do you know how smart I'd be today? Whoa. I'd say move over, Mr. Albert. Einstein, that is. Yeah, I should. I should really do that. <laughs> Don't make me do that again. And people on the YouTube that are watching this next week or whenever it gets posted, they won't know what's going on. So they said, look at the crazy preacher. Every man, and here, here's, this is the most important, part of, most important part of this chapter for you. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now listen to this little formula. Lust plus temptation equals sin. Nothing really wrong with temptation in and of itself, and there's nothing wrong with lust all by itself. It's when you put the two of them together. That's when the problem comes in. Lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. <clears throat> and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Not just physical death, although that could happen. God could say, I've had enough of you. Or, and you make it to the judgment seat and you're lost and you end up paying for this sin throughout eternity. If that's what you want to do, you can join Stephen Hawking. He died last week. One of the world's premier scientists who is about as dumb as a wall. 
He wrote more things anti-God. He didn't believe God existed. Part of the reason is because he was in that wheelchair for 50 years. He wasn't even supposed to live six months, but he lived 50 more years, and he was in that wheelchair. And You know, if God was a real God, he wouldn't put me in this wheelchair. He hadn't read the Bible, obviously, to understand it. Now he knows better. The first thing my wife looked at each other, and we said, well, he's dead. He knows better now. He kept saying, God doesn't exist. God doesn't exist. There's no way he could know that. I heard about a young man who was confronting an atheist who was on a street corner expounding his philosophy about God does not exist. There is no God. The young boy stood up and he says, sir, you keep saying there's no God. There's no God. Well, does that mean you know everything? And the man said, well, no. I don't know everything. Well, do you know 50% of everything? And the atheist said, yeah, maybe so. Maybe I know 50% of everything. And he said, the young boy said, smart young boy, what if God exists in the 50% you don't know? You know, there is no such thing as a real atheist. Because to be a true atheist, you'd have to know that God doesn't exist. And to know that God doesn't exist, you have to be everywhere at the same time, all the time. You'd have to know everything. And if you knew everything and you were everywhere at the same time, who would you be? And just prove your own argument, right? <laughs> there is no such thing as a true atheist. Of course, I like the agnostics myself. They don't know that that word comes from two Greek words, which simply means no knowledge. So every time they say they're an agnostic, they're saying, I have no knowledge. And then I say, you're right, dummy. You don't have any knowledge. There's no such thing as a real atheist. It's an impossibility. Madeline Murray O'Hare, when she was alive, she was the head of the atheist organization in the United States and probably other countries. She was having a debate on the radio with W.A. Criswell, who at that time was a pastor of First Baptist Church, Dallas. And she, she made no good points. W.A. Criswell had plenty. At the end of the whole thing, they each got a couple of minutes to make their closing statement. She made hers, which didn't make a whole lot of sense about why she didn't believe there was a God. W.A. Criswell made his statement like this. He said, you know, this woman keeps saying there's no God, and yet here she is debating me on national radio about, about whether there's a God or not. Why won't she just ignore him if there's no God? And he says, because God won't ignore her. <laughs> well, that's the problem. She's trying to prove God doesn't exist. Why? Because God won't leave her alone. And that's the way most people are. They do not want God in their life because God will mess up your fun. He does. But he gives you other fun that's better and you don't have to pay for it later. I have, a lot, I have just loads of fun every day of my life. I'm having fun. I laugh. I'm having a great time. But it doesn't get me in trouble. At least it hasn't yet. Except with my wife, but she fixes that when we go home. And she says, yeah, you just think you want dinner. I said, please, can I have some dinner, honey? She said, right after I knock your head off with this frying pan. But she's the only one I ever get in trouble with. <clears throat> Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. But, folks, what you don't understand is what a good gift is. Sometimes the best answered prayer, there's country singers that understand this because they sing about it. The best answered prayer sometimes is no. You don't know what you need. You know what you want. But what you want and what you need may be two totally different things. What you may need today may be a kick in the butt. I've had a few of those myself from God, so I know. And I found out that that's what I needed at the time. It didn't feel good at the time. I didn't like it. But later on, it really helped me. There's no shadow of turning with God. That means there's no shady areas in God's law. There's no... Middle of the road, there's no gray area. Well, some people come and say, Brother June, I don't like that verse there in the Bible. I think that's kind of open to interpretation. 
Except the Bible says there's no such thing as a private interpretation. Even though TV preachers will stand up all the time and tell you they've got a new insight. They're lying. Hello, you're lying. Maybe some of them will get in there and watch my YouTube thing and say, well, he, ain't he don't matter because he ain't rich like us. If I got to be like him to be rich, I'd rather jump off a bridge in Arizona. <laughs> well, there's short bridges in Arizona. <laughs> there's right and there's wrong. There's no in between. It's kind of like this. There's leaded and there's unleaded, right? There's caffeinated and decaffeinated or a cow with no legs. But you don't have an in-between. There is no in-between. And it's sad that people don't get that. They're trying to make bargains with God. And I've had people tell me that I made a deal with God. You don't make deals with God. You either obey him or you don't. It's that simple. <clears throat> <clears throat> of his own will he begat us. This is a term like having a baby. He's trying to illustrate. It's a metaphor. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We are betrothed to Christ. The Christians are the church is the bride of Christ. Christ is the husband in the illustration. That's why the Bible tells us in Revelations the Christians are going to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the Lamb, Jesus, is going to be sitting at the head of the table. <clears throat> so, let every man be swift to hear. we got a problem with that, don't we? Uh, being swift to ear, hear means that you take your ears and you use your ears to catch words. It's kind of like, you ever heard a sound and then you kind of turn your head this way and that way trying to figure out where it's coming from? Well, you're supposed to do the same thing with words. Try to catch the words and the meaning of the words. And be slow to speak. I run into some people that can talk. We were watching a, a, a guy the other day, and he talked for 30 minutes, and I don't think he ever once took a breath. He must have the biggest lungs in the world. He just kept on fast. I mean, motor mouth. Had me dizzy. And slow to wrath. That means don't get angry easily. How many times have you ever gotten angry about something only to find out you didn't have all the facts? Oh, some of you have done that, right? I've done it at least <laughs> once. Or 20 times or 30, I don't know. Get all ready to speak. Get all upset about some issue only to find out you don't even know what you're talking about. That's why he says be slow to wrath. Think things through before you open your trap. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, thus says the Lord. Just back up, give God room to work. Instead of trying to take care of things yourself, because in all likelihood, all you're going to do is make a bigger mess than what you've already got. Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word of God which is able to save your souls. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify your members which are upon the earth. Talks about lust and greed and uh, deceitfulness, lying and stealing and all these things. Mortify, the, put them away from you. Get away from them. Don't do that. Lay them aside. Be ye doers of the word. And not hears only. Okay, I'm going to give you a little sh shot in the dark here so you'll know. The Bible says, do not be drunk. Now you read that and then you say, I want to be a doer of the Word of God. I heard the Word of God. The Word of God said, be not drunk. But I want to be a doer of the Word of God. So if I'm going to be a doer of the Word of God that says, be not drunk, what am I going to do? Don't drink. Then you become a doer of the Word of God and not just a hearer of the Word of God. Best way to never get drunk is what? Don't drink. That's what I did. I used to drink. Martin used to drink. All God's children used to drink. No, I don't know about all God's children, but a lot of them <laughs> used to drink. 
I drank to get drunk. I never did like the taste of alcohol. I just drank to get drunk. Of course, after the first couple or the six pack, it tasted pretty good. Because you're all your all your taste buds are dead by then. <laughs> you know. Then one day I became a Christian. And now I want to obey God. So I start reading the Word of God because God says, read the Word of God. Second Timothy Second Timothy 3.15. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that needs not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I want to be a, wor a doer of the word of God. So what do I do? I study God's word. Because that's what God said do. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I want to be a doer of God's word. What am I going to do? Well actually it's what am I not going to do. Commit adultery. It's really not complicated. It's just that people make it complicated. Because they don't want to do it. They want to do what they want, and they keep coming. To, and I hate it when people do this to me. Well, Brother June, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know I'm living in adultery, but we're in love. I said, what does it say in the Bible? You can commit adultery if you're in love. They don't even spell it right. L-U-V. <laughs> I mean, and, and when people tell me that, usually it's people that profess to be Christians. But they don't want to be doers of God's word because they're having too much fun doing what they're doing. All us men have thoughts. Hello. Somebody said, Brother June, do you ever have a lustful thought? Hello, I was a man before I was a preacher. <laughs> sure. But what do you do with it? Do you nurture it? I had one guy tell me one day, pray for me, Brother June, I have a real problem with lust. And I looked at him and I said, what kind of books do you read? He said, you know, Playboy, Penthouse, Hustler. I said, well, I know what you need to do. He said, what's that? I said, get you a new library. <laughs> well, that'd be a good start, wouldn't it? Why play with it? And some of you get on your phones now and get, man, somebody asked me today about my phone. I said, I ain't got no smartphone. I got a dumb phone. And I'm glad I got it. You know, I have never sent a text and I'm never planning never to send a text. Some of the people I do business with, they said, we'll text you. I said, no, you won't. <laughs> they said, why won't I? I said, because I ain't going to read it. All I do is when I get a text on my phone, I never look at it. I hand it to my wife and I say, here, honey, get this off my phone. You want to talk to me? You talk to me either face to face or on the telephone where I can hear your voice so I can know what you're talking about because I can't tell what kind of mood you're in from a text. And that's why the world has gone crazy. People say anything they want to, and then they say, well, I didn't mean it that way. And they probably didn't. I don't have a computer. Now, folks, all us men, I, I would imagine just about everybody in here has seen pornography at one time or another in your life. But I don't make it available. 51% of all the men in churches in surveys watch pornography on a regular basis and almost the same percentage of women. You guys didn't know that, did you? Well, now you know. And one of the great sources is the computer. I don't have a computer. I, you can accuse me of a lot of things, but you're not going to accuse me of using a computer to watch things I shouldn't be watching. It's not going to happen. The computer work at our office and everything is done by my wife. I don't care what she watches. Because I can't stand there and be her chaperone. But I know my wife. And she's not interested. I know that because I chase her around the house and I can't catch her. <laughs> so I know she's not interested. <laughs> See, I didn't have to hold up my sign for that one. <laughs> Whatever it takes, folks. Whatever it takes. <clears throat> Be doers of the word of God, not hearers only, deceiving your own self. And anybody's a hearer of the word and not a doer. That man is like somebody that looks in the mirror and then walks away and doesn't see himself the way he saw him when he looked in the mirror. When he looked in the mirror, he looked at himself and he went, yuck. But then when he walked away, he thought he was pretty handsome. God's gift to the female gender. I've had some people, they think they are like that. And some of you girls do the same thing. You think you're Betty Grable, reincarnated. But you're not. 
And girls, while we're on this subject, let me tell you something. They really help you, especially at God. You don't want to be looking for a, to hook up with somebody around here. Everybody here has got problems. But these guys, guys, if they get a chance, they will tell you anything they think you want to hear to try to get on your good side. They will, and you guys know it. But you know what? If you're not careful, you'll end up like some of the women that have come through God tell that we've had to counsel with. And I was checking in this one lady one day. She had five children with her. And every child had a different last name. This woman had no education. She was just taking care of the kids. And every man she's got, he run off. The only hope she had for success in life was to... Five dollars. <laughs> the only hope that woman had was to find some man, another man, that would love her and cherish her and want her for the rest. But who wants a woman with five kids that all have different last names? That's sad, isn't it? I don't know what happened to her. I can guess. Somewhere down the line, those kids probably ended up with CPS. They were all little kids, too. They were all like a year apart or so, you know. I felt sorry for her. She had no looks left. I mean, she didn't have anything to even attract a man. She wasn't attractive. Duh. And with those five kids running around her feet, she was doubly not attractive. I mean, anybody here want to volunteer? I'll go find her again. Of course, maybe we could get her a dating app. I don't want a dating app. I told my wife, I, one day I said, honey, if you ever die, I know what I'm going to do to get me a new wife. She says, what? I said, look at this paper. We're looking at the newspaper in Livingston. And there was a picture of the Sunday school class, the adult Sunday school, the senior, uh, a senior adult Sunday school class from First Baptist Church in Livingston. And they were going on a field trip. And there was like 20 widow women and two guys. And the two guys had the biggest smiles on their face you ever saw. I said, honey, if you die, I'm going to that Sunday school class. <laughs> but I'm not going to a bar to hook up, and I certainly ain't going to hang around here. Now, I don't mean anything ugly, but you got to get your problems solved first. I don't need extra baggage. i got enough of my own. See, i got one here under this eye and one under this eye. <clears throat> that was funny. So be a doer of the word of God. Don't be like that man that looks in the mirror and then doesn't know what he is like, really. Because, and, and this is a metaphor, it's talking about the law. He says, whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's the mirror, and continues therein, keeps looking, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man is blessed in his deeds or his doing, the grace of God. Now, pure religion, as we close, this is very important. You want to get into heaven without Jesus, here it is. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, he deceives his own heart and his religion is vain. Pure religion is this. Listen carefully. <clears throat> Visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And keeping yourself unspotted from the world. You met anybody like this? Somebody who that every time they pass the nursing home, they jump out of the car and go visit everybody in there. And then they go down the street and come to another nursing home, they jump out of the car and go, that's what he's talking about. They're going down the street and they find people who are a widow. This guy finds, or it could be a woman, but we'll use a man. He finds this widow and she, he, her house is in repair. So he comes over there and she's poor and he says, ma'am, he says, I'd like to fix up your house. She says, I can't afford to pay you anything. He, That's all right. Well, I can't even afford the materials. I'll pay for them. It doesn't matter. I just want to fix it. That's what God's talking about right there. Every time you see a need, you meet it. And then on top of that, keeping yourself unspotted from the world. That means you never sin. Who's like that? Jesus. Jesus is the only one. He's the only one that had pure religion. 
We don't have it. I've met people that tell me they're God. You know, I had a guy one day, he comes in and he says, I went out to the front of the building to get him for Bible study. And I said, you need to come in for Bible study. And he says, oh, I don't need to go to Bible study. I said, why not? He said, because I wrote the Bible. <laughs> well, I was young and stupid. And I said, well, let's just go inside and we're going to talk about God. I don't need to talk about God. I said, why not? Because I am God, he told me. I've had a lot of people tell me they were God. Now, there's one guy came in with two other buddies one day, and I asked him, I said, who is Jesus? Because you see, the number one question in Christianity is who is Jesus? Is he God who became man in order to pay the penalty for our sin, or is he less than that? And if he's less than that, then you've got the wrong Jesus. He's God. John 1.1 1, 1 will tell you that, and other places. Well, <clears throat> I asked the guys, I said, do you know Jesus? And the one guy on my left said, yes, we know Jesus. I said, who is he? And he turned to the guy in the middle and tried to introduce me to Jesus. And I said, you know, the Bible says if somebody says this is Jesus, he's a liar. I said, you guys are liars. And then Jesus cussed me out. <clears throat> I had never been cussed out by Jesus before. I got a little sarcastic. They, they went out, out of the building and then I stood out on the porch and a little while they came walking by and I looked at them and I said, guys, I feel sorry for you. And one guy says, there's no sorrow in heaven. I said, that's right, because you ain't going to be there. I got a little sarcastic. But, folks, I've been told this over and over and over. I've had people come and tell me, I have never sinned. And I said, sit down at the table. And we start talking about the commandments. And then the first thing I find out is they're a liar. Because they did do something wrong. I pinned them down to something. And then they say, I, I say, well, 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 you're a liar. And this one guy looked at me and says, well, one out of ten is not bad. But the Bible says if you break the least of the commandments, you're guilty of all of them. And I went through and showed him how breaking that one commandment linked all of them together. People do that. Oh, I've never sinned. I don't sin. I don't sin. So I watch them. And then I find out they're telling a lie. What they do in a lot of cases, they redefine sin and they lower the bar so they can get over it easier. They change the standard. I've seen preachers do that same thing. You're having an affair behind your wife's back and you're the pastor of the church? Well, yeah, but it's okay. You know, I mean, it's, it's not that big a deal. Yeah, hello? It is. I've seen preachers that drink. So, you know, what is wrong with you? And then they try to justify it. And do all kinds of crazy things. You can't justify any kind of sin, folks. Sin is just sin. That's all it is. It's not a big sin and a little sin. It's just sin. The sin of adultery is just as wicked and evil as the sin of homosexuality. Lying and cheating is just as bad as murder. But you see, we try to classify ourselves as good better, best, when really we're just all rotten. We are. We have wicked hearts. That's why you need Jesus. Father, thank you for loving us. We do thank you for your word tonight. We're very grateful for the salvation you've provided. And the resurrection from the dead is so important because so many religions out here are worshiping dead saviors. They know where they're buried. But we don't have a savior that's in a tomb. He's risen, he's alive, and he changes people from the inside. We don't have to keep a bunch of rules and regulations because if we really give our lives to Christ, he shows us what we need to do and what we don't. And we do it, we want to, we want to please him. We're not perfect, but we are consistent. And we thank you for that. 
When we do sin, we don't try to hide it. We call it what it is. And I believe with all my heart that when we do that, you smile. The greatest king that ever lived was King David, yet he was a sinner. And the Bible shows us all the warts that he had and everything. Solomon, the wisest, richest king that ever came along, you gave him all this stuff. And yet, in the end of his lives, his wives, they turned him away from you. And he became an idol worshiper. So we know they're not perfect. And that's one reason why I know that man didn't write the Bible, because we would have left those parts out. We'd have put David and Solomon and Hezekiah and all those great kings. We'd have put them up on pedestals. Noah, Moses. We see all their warts. Noah was a man of righteousness, yet the first thing he did after he got out of that ark was to plant him a vineyard. And after that matured, he made wine and got drunk. You let us see all that. You let us see Job's doubts. Adam's inability to control his wife. Till end up, both of them end up sinning. And you just let us see it all so we'll understand. We're no better and no different. We are sinners. But by the grace of God, when we come to you and seek forgiveness, you give it to us. And we get into a heaven we don't deserve, not because we're good, but because we're forgiven. And we thank you for that. We ask you to bless each person in this room. Help them to see your word with their heart. Help them to want to be doers of the word of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.